Okay. Great, and we are live. I'd like to welcome everyone to the last session of the day. This is going to be a really sort of fun and interactive session, so I'm really, really keen. Um, let's hope that I can stream and use QGIS at the same time without my computer crashing. So um, I will just hand over to Tim, who's going to take us through to our QGIS 3D freestyle session. Woohoo. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, this is a like an interactive session where you all invited to participate. So we've got a panel of QGIS nerds present in the room, but just because we are this side of the camera doesn't mean you can't also just participate with us. Um, and um, basically the format is that we're going to give everybody a data set, the same data set ideally, um, that we've generated using this gen, a random DEM generator. And then you can take the, the DEM and do whatever you like. The, the only like, preconditions are that you can't bring in existing data. So you've got to create everything from scratch from the DEM, or you can digitize points or lines or whatever on top of it, or you can uh, produce new products using whatever means you want to, and analysis tools or you know Python, whatever you want to do. But uh, you can't use something that you've already got like lying on your disk. Okay, And um, at the end of it, the idea is that you produce a picture or a layout or a map or something that's visual and that we will um, share them on the GitHub repo that I've made. Um, and then we'll have some kind of um, judging panel that will will review the, the what we've submitted and not just ours, but from the community at large and uh, come up with a winner. And the winner will get a QGIS coffee cup sponsored by Cartoza. Okay, and it will be um, the beautiful black one with the cutest logo. And there's a picture of it on the wiki page. Um, so to get started, um, I'm just going to share my screen and give you some like some how to find your way to the to the page. And we can if you can put it in the chat of YouTube as well for us. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find sure. the share button here. Uh, so if you go to the hack first. Uh, open day, sorry, I'm dating myself now. The QGIS Open Day page. Um, you'll find the talk details for um, the session. Um, and um, you'll see that on beneath the coffee cup um, icon, I've put a link to the freestyle page, which should take you to here. Um, let me just actually click it to see where it goes. Um, and there's the same rules, which I just explained, basically, that you can't use pre-existing data. And I, I'm hoping that we can do future sessions. I'm making one, basically, an issue in GitHub for each session. So today's session is number one here. Um, and on that session, you'll find there's this, um, this QGIS open day dem dot zip, which is the data set that we all use. I haven't looked at it yet either. Um, and... Um, when you've when you've created something then just make it as a png or a zip file and then you just drop it in as a comment on this issue okay so amy if you i'll share in the chat if you can share the issue it's the shortest way to get to where we are now you can share that on youtube as well that would be great and um what we'd like to do is just kind of like switch between uh, like share your screen alternatively so we can kind of like peek as you as you're building stuff um, and maybe uh, you give a little update every few minutes or um, between between us and the panel here of what we've been making. That's it. That's it's simple, I think. I hope. <laughs> if anything not clear, just you can tell me. And um... all good. Dem downloaded. Link on YouTube ready. Ready. Start your engines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's go. Yeah. Oh. I hope the, the dem looks all right because it looks oh there we go. <laughs> so that's what you're gonna you should you should be starting off with. And it's at, at pixel values in degrees. Sorry. It's in uh, with a wonderful EPSG four three two six. Um, so, so, so each you, pixel you is one free, degree. <laughs> you can feel free to that's, that's pretty big. To anything you like. Um, 
or you can reassign the coordinate re reference system. It's it's in fantasy land. It's nowhere. Um, well, I think at this point it might be on another planet. <laughs> <laughs> Me like another planet. I could go for the alien thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Ojival, I think I cut you off there. Uh, were you saying something else? Yeah, I was just wondering about the CRS. I think a lot of the tools going to break if we don't assign a CRS or reproject it to something. Yeah. So, That's a challenge, yeah? Yeah. I have a solution without projections that should work. I see you've got the Python command for using the script to generate new DIMMs, Tim. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's got some dependencies, uh, I think, on Gudel, which is not available on every Python environment. Yeah, but just use, you can just use the one in the ticket. I mean, you should uh, ideally all use the same one. No, I'm, I'm using the same one. I'm just saying yeah. for people who want to use that, that generation. Yeah, it works. Great under the next, that's a good reason to <laughs> switch to the <Linux, laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I used it on Conda on Windows, worked well, needed NumPy. Okay. Yeah, Conda will work well on Windows. Oh, Tim, are you speaking? No, would you like to? Uh, I was just wondering if you were because I can't hear anything. <laughs> no, I'm deep in thought, looking at my screen and pondering about my. Rest a mask polygonization that I'm busy doing. <laughs> We're sort of hoping that uh, those watching, if even if you're not participate, you can and we can switch to the next person's screen in a second. That you can kind of learn some QGIS tips by watching uh, what people do here. Um, Somebody's got something interesting to show on their screen, you can just shout and then we can swap this screen sharing over. I don't know if it's possible to all share screens at the same time. That could also be an option. I don't know. Can Jitsi do that? <laughs> I think YouTube can't handle that because it needs focus on one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Wait, I, I've got something to show. Let me just share the screen. I just will stop here. Um, Go for it. Right. So I was doing it. I think I just want to set up the, the base map and then I want to do some analysis and uh, do uh, show on top, but to, for the base map, what I did was I just assigned a CRS to the layer just because some of my analysis tools need natural units. So um, I just assigned EPSG 3857, and this is the, the base then. Uh, the first step I did was just did some styling. So I had a, a style map file, uh, which I prepared, which I commonly use for my demos, just a, a nice, uh, color ramp that I assigned and you know, uh, this looks like this and then I generated a hill shade uh, out of it. So this is the, the hill shade and uh, what I want to show is this uh, trick I learned actually from Kurt Menke a while back and I still use it is uh, if I want to do a colorized hill shade you can kind of blend both of these together and this is using uh, this layer blending modes. So if I change it to multiply I get this uh, very nice uh, colorized hill shade. 
uh, which takes the top layer is just a uh, black and white hill shade. It's blending it with the, the, the uh, actual colorized uh, layer below. So this is what I'm going to use as a the face map. And I'll, I'll try to kind of build some analysis on top of this. It looks beautiful. Thank you. That looks really cool. I like it. <laughs> Thanks. Do you want to switch to the next person's screen so that we always have somebody? Amy, show us what you've got there. Well, I'm not chancing you just and streaming at the same time. So okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll Maybe show it's... you if I do. Okay. Let's have a look at Vicky's screen, maybe. Vicky, you want to show? Yeah, it? let's look at Vicky's screen. Ooh. So, I think I'll start. I'll start by just making a symbology for the mountains that I want. Nice. What's always important for the hillshade is to, to show the uh, resampling uh, settings. Because they, oh. uh, it can be quite coarse. It's always a little trick there. Especially if you're zoomed into the DM, then the bilinear will uh, give better results. Is that for getting rid of the? The little squares you start seeing, Hans. Yes. And where is it? Yeah, the, okay. It's on the screen oh, that's uh, shared. Yeah. Sorry, it's on which screen? On your screen, uh -huh. under resampling, zoomed oh, in, okay. and then you can change that to uh, bilinear. And you see it will smooth. Yeah, you see it more spectacular if you're zoomed in oh yeah it's very she... oh. ah yeah <laughs> the little squares are gone yeah now the thing is that that's just for visual uh applications mm -hmm. a useful one but if you want to do calculations and you are reprojecting dems then you need to stick to uh, nearest neighbor if you want to do calculations because bilinear is averaging values so i don't know if the others have opinions or experiences with that but that's what i always advise I'm just trying to figure out how to apply a symbol to a particular, um, what do you call it, uh, levels of symbology. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
<laughs> Let me move on. Someone else should, as I figure something out. <laughs> Alrighty, let's maybe see what Charlie's up to in his alien land. <laughs> Oh, I think he's gone. <laughs> he ran away when you put his um, <laughs> name in spotlight. No, uh, I, I, he seems to have. So let's go on to Hans and see what he's got, got up to so far. Well, that looks cool. So what's your goal? For this. Well, people know me from uh, hydrological analysis, so that's exactly what I'm doing and proving how robust these tools are that even if you give some random generated DEM that it will work. And what I'm using is these uh, new uh, PC raster tools integrated in uh, QGIS. By the way, we are uh, going ahead with having a processing provider plugin of PC raster uh, ready soon. Niall Dawson is uh, working on it, so you'll hear more about that. But meanwhile, in um, one of the last uh, uh, open day sessions, I've presented uh, how to get all these PC raster tools here. And what I did was convert the DEM to the PC raster format because that is something that's uh, needed. It's uh, a GDAL format, so that's quite easy and fast. And then I used LDD create, that is here. Basically, that is filling all the sinks in this uh, DEM because any DEM that you uh, receive uh, in what way it has been uh, um, acquired doesn't matter, but for hydrological purposes, you need to get rid of uh, artificial depressions. Um, so that's what I, uh, I did here. So you need to, to put the, the DEM there. And then um, there are many more settings than in other tools uh, that were available. So you can control quite a bit how it's filling uh, the DEM. After that, I want to have the rivers, so I calculated the straller orders in PC Raster. That is the uh, stream order tool. Here. So it just needs that local drain direction layer, which is the flow direction. Uh, and then it creates the straller orders. And then there's an interesting thing that I always like uh, to do, often get the question, how do I get all the subcatchments without uh, having all the coordinates? And what you can do here is um, you can look at the Strahler order of the downstream cell. There's a tool here, it's called downstream. And it will get the cell value of the neighboring downstream cell. And then there's a rule, if the downstream cell is of a different Strahler order, it means you are at a junction of rivers. You're at a bifurcation. That means that that's an outlet of a subcatchment, unless you're uh, at, the, at the spring or at the outlets itself, the main outlet. So if you apply that, you can get all the outlets and then you can calculate the catchments with the catchment tool here. Feeding in those uh, outlets. And there's a variety of tools for that. There's also subcatchment. Um, you can imagine that subcatchments are nested. So if you are uh, further downstream, that it will cover upstream catchments that are part of the bigger catchment that it's part of. So with subcatchment, you uh, with that tool, you will preserve uh, those. So it will not cover the previous delineated subcatchments. Of course, after all this talking, you want to see results. This is catchments and this is subcatchments and then blended with the uh, DM with the hill shade. And here are the rivers. And later I'm going to show you that you can do this with a model in a model builder, connecting all these uh, steps. But I leave that a bit as a cliffhanger for later. And meanwhile, <laughs> going to work on further styling this because that's difficult. I saw that uh, Tim was working on that mask, which is a smart thing to do <laughs> because my island just uh, goes into the water and those rivers are uh, submarine uh, uh, rivers too. <laughs> I knew that, but it's just uh, conceptually quite difficult. A raster or lots of different steps to, to, to connect, but uh, we still have time. Maybe I'll do that. Absolutely. Anyways, very colorful, always these catchment maps, random colors. And 
and here you see the strollers. Let me switch off and I can style that with palette of unique values. Um, to select the correct one. So here each color represents a strala order of the river of a threshold that I have uh, decided on. And you can better use uh, blues here or Mako inverted. The larger the number, the bigger the river. So here we see how the river increases to towards the outlet. And then if I combine that with the catchments, sorry, uh, I need to sub catchment one. And you can see that each reach has its own subcatchment here. And that's the whole exercise that I was doing here. You need color television for this. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond, what are you doing? I'm curious. <laughs> are you yeah. producing chocolate already of, of your DEM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that should be my goal. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I could I think make a chocolate for for this. But um I thought I'd make a sewer system because I learned that earlier today. So I thought I have to come up with something new here. <laughs> <laughs> but um I, I didn't really manage to uh, to do that. But I wanted to, to try the the plugin from Brazil we saw earlier today in the in the session um but i haven't even installed it yet so i'm almost there now and to so be honest, what you're I saying basically raymond is when you discover an uninhabited island the first thing you would do is install the sewer network before, <laughs> before yeah, yeah, because, because there is uh, two million people living on that island and they <laughs> lack uh, drinking water and uh yeah <laughs> all right there are a couple of questions coming in so um, Leonardo from earlier asks Hans, the analysis done in PC raster tools don't need a coordinate system to configure in meters to work, question mark? Well, it does, but this was my advantage here. Uh, I, I saw how Ushval solved it by uh, creating an artificial uh, projection. Uh, PC raster doesn't keep track of the projections. It just doesn't do anything with it. But of course, all these tools also, Saga and Grass, they assume that your X and Y coordinates are this in the same units as the Z. So if you calculate the slope, the function will uh, calculate the uh, steepest slope in a three by three window, but it assumes that the Z is in the same unit as X and Y. So if you use a geographic coordinate system, then your X and Y will be in uh, degrees and your Z in meters probably, and then it will calculate uh, the slope in the wrong way, but it doesn't tell you, it will still calculate and you probably even end up with a beautiful map, but it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so my advantage here was uh, PC Raster uh, puts all these question marks at the, in QGIS at the, the CRS, and which is great. I can just continue without bothering about it. Alrighty, and then next, um, Ban Kasim is a new member or new to QGIS, so welcome to the community, yay. Um, but he asks, are these tools to calculate the catchment in QGIS? Um, and can they? can you use it to make catchment maps? Yes, you can. This is all QGIS. So, um, but um, well, maybe a little bit of uh, of history there. The uh, um, there are grass tools and there are Saga tools that come with QGIS at the moment. Uh, but this might change in in the future, and there are already changes happening which uh, break a few of the catchment delineation functions. And you need to have uh, the old dependencies, or you need to tweak the description files of uh, of Saga, for example. Uh, so, but it's very likely that these will move out of the, the core uh, of the processing toolbox, but you can add them later as a processing provider tool. And therefore it makes perfectly sense that also other tools are uh, developed like that, such as the PC raster tool, mm -hmm. instead of packaging it with QGIS that you can simply install it as a processing provider, like you can also do for R. And then, uh, yeah, the sky's the limit. It's just this whole uh, Lego box of different tools from different providers that you can uh, connect. All right, great stuff. Um, I'm just checking if there are any more comments. Hello, Jonathan from Panama. Um, yeah, let's continue and maybe check in with Utvald again if you've gotten any further. Yeah, uh, let me just show you what I've got.
And Tim's up next, so start planning your great reveal. <laughs> Oh, wow. So, yeah, I spent a lot of my time doing analysis. And one of the longest things that I wanted to do for the longest time was to figure out how to do least cost path analysis in QGIS. And there are tools for CRAS uh, where you can do this. Uh, there are no native tools yet, uh, but I found a plugin that seemed to work quite well. So I thought that would be a good uh, way to uh, try this out uh, for today. So here, what I did was I generated uh, random points within the so first step. And it was, I just created a mask, uh, which is uh, created in zero elevation. Uh, we don't want to swim while we're doing the list cost path analysis. So <laughs> uh, I, I created the mask, uh, clipped my uh, dim, and then uh, again, this is uh, one of the issues with QGIS that's, uh, that we have. Uh, even when you clip, there's a, a precision issue uh, with floating points. So it doesn't clip exactly at that location. So there are still, because of the partial pixels, uh, uh, you still got some negative values. And again, uh, uh, for doing the least cost part, I, uh, it's better to have a, a value between like, uh, uh, say, 0 to 100. So I rescaled my raster between 1 to 100. Zero is really bad for least cost part because then everything will flow along those cost zero because there's no cost, right? So uh, I assign, uh, use the rescale uh, tools here. So this is a quite handy tool, rescale raster and scaled all the raster from like minus uh, one, minus 17 to, to 190 to zero to 100 or one to 100. And once I had that, uh, I just generated some random source and destination points within that uh, area. And I thought, let's say, if I were to go from here to all these different places, uh, how would you go? If you were lazy and you didn't want to climb, because you want to take the least cost path. And this is what the, the output that got generated that, you know, you would, if you want to go from here to here, you can see most of the paths taking the, the, the least cost around just walking around the beach here. And then you climbing up in a straight line, which is uh, the least cost path uh, for here. So this is what I've got so far. And I'm going to keep tweaking this and then I'm going to create, visualize this in 3D. That's the next step. All righty, cool. So um, BG asks, they like your interface and how can you change it to gray? I'm assuming to change it to dark mode so that you can do in the settings. Um, and then the next comment is that they can't really see um, with the contrast of the dark mode, your icons, etc. That. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a Mac, so this is the QGIS Mac interface. Mm. It's not dark mode. I think the, this is the default one. So. Oh, okay, cool. So that's what Mac looks like. Yeah. Yeah, but you can you can switch it to the sort of regular looking one. But um, I think you're in the night mapping theme. Um, visual. Yeah, I believe so. Let me just see which ones I'm. So I like to use dark mode for like work, but for presentation, you see sometimes don't see the menus that clearly. So. All right. Uh, this cool. is a blend of gray. This is the. Uh, uh. Another uh, UI theme. Oh. So. Cool. Cool. There's one question um, for you, Hans. Um, it's from Shabir B. <laughs> um, how do or how to how do you overcome stream channel breaks caused by glaciers? Uh, global warming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's a very specific question that I've never uh, considered. <laughs> but uh, it is it is actually quite uh, quite easy because if you have the um, the elevation below your glacier then you have your stream system uh, delineated from that uh, base DEM. So the, the solution is that you have a different layer for the elevation of the surface of your glaciers and uh, the elevation of the, the surface. I think that's the only solution. And I think there are some uh, some products uh, from, from satellite measurements uh, where you can, uh, can get uh, that information from maybe. 
Okay, great stuff. I think let's um, pop over to Tim's screen and see what he's been up to. There we go. Um, I'm doing uh, kind of some some things the same and some things different to everybody else. I um, I did also make a little 3D scene quickly of my area, but what I'm actually doing is because um, I, I want I, my island to be like a nice place to live, so I'm just designing a ring road <laughs> around it, and then I've made a, I've made a grid, and I'm gonna make some like some urban areas with a grid uh road layout which i'm going to use this to just the grid to snap to while i'm designing my road layout and kind of make a little bit of a urban framework that we can take um raymond's sewage system and add to my road network and then we'll have <laughs> between that and Ushval's routing system and um answers river network we'll have the whole <laughs> The whole deal all in place there so i was about to just uh go and like uh edit my road layer here and just make a form because i want to um i want to capture the data in a consistent way if i was i had a bit more time i would make something a bit more fancy but i'm going to just do like a quick and dirty form um using the drag and drop form designer to kind of have some uh uh control the vocabulary of what people type into the form or people being myself at this point um <laughs> i'm gonna try not to talk and type at the same time i usually end up in a mess but i'm setting up my road types here so i'm kind of giving them a, a like a human facing side on the description and uh computer uh, a name for the computer to work with on the other side in the comments i think it's leti my my south african eye wants to say it leti <laughs> um it complains that there's no archaeology sad face ah. and ahoy from in slovakia um but you're just going to have to make the archaeology dim. That's the point of freestyling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just uh, get busy. <laughs> I think we should make this an alien world where there's some alien archaeology. That would be cool. <laughs> One tip maybe you can see on the form is I'm just using this now function of QGIS so that every every road I add gets a timestamp, um, and uh, which is a nice way to just make sure that you can keep a, like a history of when things happen on your map. We can, I'm planning to use the history later to make some fun visualizations as well. I was about to ask if you, if you're timestamping them, could you later on animate in some way? Yeah, that's what I'm aiming for. Oh, and, okay. Okay. And I'll just show you now that with that form that I just made, um, I get nice little form here with the date pre-filled in and a list of types of road that I can pick from. So next, my plan is to start digitizing some city network. I'm just trying to decide where the best place to put a city is, or not a city, a town, probably. The island's not big enough for a city. But um, I guess, uh, yeah, I probably got to be over, maybe over here. There's a lovely bay and good for tourism and you can swim out to the, to the uh, what do you call this? Prom this uh, Peninsula. Causeway. Peninsula, thank you. <laughs> So. Oh, Liti is Tibor's um, screen name. Hi, Tibor. Nice to hear oh. from you. You should have been in the room. You could have shown us all the archaeology. <laughs> it's not too late. You can come and join us. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. What are you doing there now, Tim? I'm just, uh, I took the, the con I generated contours for the island and then I'm taking the, like the first one at about five meters and using that as the, as the line for the ring road. Because if you're an engineer uh, and you're building a road network, it's nice to, I speak like a, like a seasoned engineer, which I'm not, it's <laughs> nice to, um, it's nice to build your road network on a kind of a flat 
um, basis so that you don't uh, have to, you know, blast away the mountainside as you're trying to tunnel through it or uh, what have you. So um, that's, that's the ring road. I'm going to set up some cartography rules after I've got a few roads, and then I'm going to start my residential network here with a bit of digitizing. That sounds awesome. I think um, perhaps we should pop over to Victoria and see what she's up to. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Um, I hear you. <laughs> I'm making a, a fantasy map over the DEM. So I'm just using um, the Rasta calculator to make masks for um, specific sections. Like I've done sort of where the, the mount, I think the mountain should be. So now I want to, to put up where I think the level of forests should be. Using a lot of the histogram to figure out where things are. <laughs> um, Raymond, Leonardo says if you need some input on the sewer system, he, he's here for you. He's ready. <laughs> Yeah, I think I could use that. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think the, since there is no map projection, uh, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. But I'm still trying to install it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I should actually watch the video uh, from earlier this day mm. while mm. watching you it's as well. <laughs> Alrighty. So what is your, your plan, Victoria, in terms of your fantasy land? Um, First get the sections that like forest, mountain, ocean sections together, and then now go to the specific sections, maybe set up, sorry, set up a, like a palm tree or something, like just on the edge. <laughs> sorry. And I'll see where it goes for there, from there. All righty, that sounds very, very cool. Uh, you showed us how to make little um, trees and boxes for our imaginary game world. So now this is going to be our imaginary game world. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, let's hop on back to Hans and see how he's gone along with his a more hydro themed stuff. So here um, I've been working on two things, putting the other tricks in the model and calculating um, yeah, the, the path from the top of the mountain to uh, to the edge <laughs> of the DEM. I still didn't calculate uh, a boundary for uh, uh, for the ocean, uh, but this is the the path if you would follow the the flow direction. So from the highest point, now how do you find the highest point? There are some nice tools here to do that. There is a map maximum. So you use your uh, DEM, and then it will output map maximum. Probably have it somewhere here. I, I've probably called this highest point. So it's a global GIS operation which will fill each pixel with that value of the highest point. So if you query that, uh, wrong layer here. It's this number here, 193.7. And what you need to do then with uh, map algebra is to find um, the, that pixel which has the highest point. So that's this pixel here. I will remove the path. So that's that's the highest point in pixels. Sorry, I'm a pixel person. There's probably some higher point inside, or just the average elevation of the pixel. And then there's the, the path tool, 
this one, where you put the uh, flow direction map, LDD, and that uh, highest point, the highest pixel, so not the one that has everything. And then it will calculate uh, the path, that's then that uh, red line, yeah, this one, and it follows the flow direction so if you need a swim after climbing the, the top, then uh, th this is probably your fastest way down. Um, <laughs> if, we are if we are still waiting for the others to make roads and other nice stops uh, on the way and visiting uh, archaeological places. Hi, Dimo, other... how are you? I see you popped into our room. Welcome. Hi, Dimo. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So maybe we can have a look at the model that I was building, if we can find yeah, it Yeah, that would be great. So here. Because then you see a bit of that process of what I've er shown earlier. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done similar things before, so I adjusted uh, on some details. Yeah, I'm assuming you didn't build this in the last no. um, 20 minutes. I'd be incredibly impressed if you had. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm cheating a little bit with that, but the regulations said don't use data from others. But <laughs> there are perks to being Hans von der Quast. Let's just say. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, here is the input digital elevation model, the one that uh, that Tim had uh, generated, and then a minimum strata order to determine your uh, what you consider as rivers. Mm -hmm. The digital elevation model is converted from TIFF to the PC raster format. Then this uh, flow direction is calculated. And then we can calculate the strata orders. And uh, then we need the strata orders uh, from a certain threshold. So that's that value that you put in here, but we can only work with spatial. So this function makes it spatial. And because it's strata orders, it's an ordinal scale. So there we get it out of it. And then, um, with the if then function, we can create uh, a Boolean out of that. And here we um, we can check the Strala order one pixel downstream. And that's how we can find the junctions because it should not be the same. It should be different from the one that it was. So I use the not equal operator. Um, then all those points need a unique ID because I want to see different uh, numbers for, this, for the catchments that we get out of that. Uh, let me see how to pen. That unique ID function um, produces uh, a nominal uh, or a scalar layer, but a scalar, which means it's, uh, it's continuous and it shouldn't be, it should be classes. So here we convert it to nominal. And then I need to add zeros in the map, that's what cover does. And then um, then I finally can calculate catchment and subcatchment and that's then reported. So long story, but uh, this, is, uh, this will be shared. Um, I think part of it is already in the um, resource sharing plugin. And if you have added the, the repository of PC raster, then there is a model section there, model collection. And there you'll find it if you install the PC raster model collection. And these are these three models. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. That's and really yeah, this, this proves it's robust enough to, to feed a random DEM diff to it, and it will produce yeah. your rivers and catchments. Well, that's really, really great to know. Um, Tibor, have you been following along? Do you have any cool dem to show us? <laughs> uh, yes, somehow. Awesome. But show us. <laughs> Okay, so it is as usual about the visualization for archaeology. I mm -hmm. have to somehow share the screen. Uh, give me half hour. Uh, <laughs> Bottom of the screen, third from the left, the little screen with an arrow in it. <laughs> okay, so I will try. Okay, probably you can see my screen. Yes, yes. So I'm usually producing this kind of visualization for the archaeology where you can see the multiple values like the curvature of the digital elevation model, the slope, the openness to the sky. Usually I'm trying to uh, divide those uh, two filters to two parts. One I call the contrast, second is called the curvature but by different way. 
and okay, I have the problem with CRS, and the result is usually a combination of really nice. Also, I believe that open source software, it is called Raster Visualization Toolbox. It was uh, produced by university in Slovenia. And they have really nice tools. And these tools also work like the plugin for the QGIS. Uh, the plugin uh, uh, I tested, uh, I think, one week ago. Only disadvantage, what, what I see of the plugin is that it doesn't use a multitude uh, approach. And this standalone tool use it. Then I'm uh, trying to stack those layers uh, with different kind of blend modes. Uh, you were talking about the uh, multiply. Many times I'm using the things like, uh, I don't know, multiply, darkness, normal, and so and so. And many of those ways how to express the curvature of the DEM is symmetrical around zero. And unfortunately, I'm a little bit stuck in the, uh, not in the CRS, but what is on and off. So here is the part for the curvature. It is based on a simple local relief model, but simple local relief model is also known in the, for instance, in the white box tools like deviation from the mean elevation of model. Then something like local dominance, it is really complicated hey, how to express the, the curvature of the digital elevation model. And then for the contrast, I'm using the combination of sky view factor. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the how you are when you are lying on the ground and you are trying to observe the sky that how much of angle you can see it. And I'm trying to combine, uh, combine it with the slope. And I'm trying to use the trick that, uh, for instance, yellow color and uh, green color of slope producing the orange color, blue color and uh, red color producing the violet color. And somehow when I mix it together, the result is like this one. And then for this, I'm using the map to raster. I really like these tools. I think it is in the raster tools convert map to raster. That's the really nice way how you can mix and blend all layer together to one layer. And uh, what I see as a big advantages of new formats is that usually by GDAL, I'm trying to convert it to the Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF uh, because uh, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, okay, the original purpose is to put it on the web and you can download it from the web. But Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF have the nice internal structure of the tiles and overviews. So Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF are really fast on the, even on the super slow and super weak computers. So this is the way how I'm producing those things. I upload, I think, to the comment on the GitHub, the example of this result. And you can play with it and you will see. That's but so brilliant i love this it's very very interesting i like to see the archaeology um application i think we're going to hop over to ujival and we'll come back to you at the end and see what you've been coming up with this is brilliant <laughs> okay Alrighty. but i i have to say to goodbye to everybody because tomorrow i'm moving to the excavation in egypt so i have to prepare myself but when oh, i saw wow. so nice topic so it was really nice to meet you Oh, Thanks. always good. Thanks, Tabur, and enjoy the excavation. Thank you. <laughs> good luck, Tabur. <laughs> yeah, I love Alrighty. how the, the blend modes and combining different outputs into a single image can actually bring out so much detail. So that's really yeah, cool. it's a fantastic. All right. Uh, so I have. I uh, remember my 2D output that I uh, had generated in QGIS. We had a DIM and some least cost part. And I used the excellent QGIS to TGS plugin to export that map to uh, a web interactive web map. And here's, uh, we have the map, uh, the same map that was in 2D. Now it's in a browser running in 3D. Uh, we have the source point in this, nice green cone 
and the destination points here. And you can now visualize uh, this data on uh, how the least cost path flows. And this is also a really nice way to validate the data. I always like to validate my analysis and say, did this algorithm did the right thing? And you can kind of see that, yeah, if you want to go from this point to here, uh, it's best to just climb down here and walk along the beach uh, or uh, you know, so on. So I think this is a great way to visualize and also uh, uh, see the the really nice uh, 3D dem in action. And just wow. a few. Uh, so cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things that I kind of uh, took a while to figure out is like I saw this really nice conical markers, and uh, I, I was just to about to ask about those. How did you get those? Yeah. So let me just uh, hop back to QGIS. And uh, essentially, once you have a map that you like, you can uh, just uh, go to install QGIS to 3JS and uh, open it up. This is what it looks like. You need to set a base elevation. So this is the elevation that uh, the 10 bit we had. And then you can add on point layers. Uh, so here we have source and destination layer. But this would just get rendered as you know uh, points. So you can right click on this and go to properties. And there you have an object of how do you want to place a marker, and there's a cone marker. Uh, the default one is uh, a cone that is upside down, like a regular cone. So to turn it upside down, I uh, just tried it at negative 30, and that worked. I think that works much better as a marker. So yeah, uh, mm, set yeah. the z coordinates at 30, and then height is minus 30. And that's how you get this cone, conical like this. And one other thing that you need to uh, remember for this QGIS to change this plugin is that it assumes your horizontal and vertical units are the same uh, units. Uh, so in this case, it's fine. It just uh, takes it up. But if you have a regular dim where it's, you know, it's in geographic CRS and your elevations in meter, uh, make sure you reproject it to uh, a linear uh, projected CRS before using that. And then you can uh, set some scene settings. There are some settings here if you want to use some vertical exaggerations and stuff like that. And once it's done, uh, file export to web. And you get uh, a folder full of uh, JavaScript uh, JSON files and HTML and just opens up. Uh, one other thing, if you want to just uh, visualize it on your computer, make sure you check this enable the viewer to run locally. Um, it'll uh, disable some of the security. Uh, settings so you can view that locally. And otherwise, if you're sticking in the server, disable that, put those files on a static server, and you have a 3D map. So that's it. I'm done, and I can now enjoy other <laughs> presentations. Oh, that is awesome. I love those little conical markers. I think they're the coolest thing ever. All righty. Um, Raymond, have you come right? Do you have any cool um, networks to show us? Uh, no, I don't. Um... <laughs> I'm actually still trying to 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 make the plugin run. <laughs> That's all right. We will then come I don't back. I think to I will <laughs> manage before the weekend uh, to have any uh, sewer system for these uh, poor people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I enjoyed watching uh, what you were doing, and uh, I think you're way better than I am in the, doing this kind of roster analysis. I think so. Uh, Thanks. As long as they're not using the river systems that Hans is creating, we do need sewer systems on this island. Um, but <laughs> let's hop over to um, Vicky and see how she's doing making a forest for our lovely imaginary people. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just try and get it on. Um, just while Victoria is sharing, um, Ban Kasim, who is new, um, just wanted to ask, obviously, you guys are all QGIS gurus, but as a beginner, how should he start with QGIS? Sort of what is the best websites? I know you guys sort of know the best places to go. I have a couple of ideas um, that I will put into the comments. But, you know, as an absolute new user, where should he go and what should he do? Well, the uh, documentation of users uh, on, on the website. Well, Tim, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if you can afford to, there's some very good books um, that I would recommend just getting a paper book that you can put next to you on the desktop, um, mm -hmm. on your on your, on your your desk while you're working with QGIS because it's may, maybe, it uh, depends on your personality, but I think it's the easiest way to get going and you also can support a lot of the authors from the QGIS community, which is also nice. So uh, Locate Press 
if you can drum up the link and put it in the chat there, Amy, they've got a bunch of nice books um, at different levels on QGIS. So I really recommend um, any of the books that they produce um, are great. And then um, on the website of QGIS, we've got uh, a training um, manual and we've also got the documentation. So the training manual has got like step-by-step -step guides for doing things which you can do all self-paced. Um, and that's where manual. I started and they're awesome mm -hmm. and the user manual is more for like if you want to find out like oh, how does this particular feature work um, it's good for going and figuring out those things um, and then looking at blogs like Ujival who's here in the call with us got a brilliant blog and um, uh, I think most of us in the room here have got some kind of like presence online where we 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 publish what we're working on and um, just reading what people do and getting tips. And um, also the, we've got the, the Telegram channel, uh, which again, Amy can put the link uh, online for you. That's a really great place. We don't mind any, there's no question too dumb as long as it's sort of on topic and polite. Um, we really like um, helping people there. Um, and uh, you, you should sort of embrace the fact that we're a community of users and we all out to help each other. So nobody's, <laughs> there's no big egos. You can just ask any question you like. Somebody will be there to, to help you if they can. Um, and uh, if you do ask a question there, just be patient. You know, somebody, maybe people are busy, but you know, just ask again nicely if nobody heard your question. Sooner or later, somebody will try to help you. Uh, and also another good thing to mention is if you are asking for help, just try to put your question clearly and so that we could got enough information to understand what it is you're trying to do. Share the sample data if you have it or, um, you know, just make, give us enough information to help you. And then the best thing to do is just do what we're doing now in this session. Just get QGIS open and start to play and see if you can make it do things. And um, it's nice to learn software out of the pressure of a client wanting something or your boss wanting mm -hmm. something. I think every QGIS user who's gotten addicted has a highly over-engineered map. I know Tim has one of his farm that is amazing. I have one of birds and bird sightings and on my phone and on QGIS that I'm building. So I think every QGIS user who started starts from a really small map that they just then engineer with every new tool that they learn. So that's a really, really great thing to do for yourself. And then upside, at the end of the day, you'll have something in your portfolio that you can show as, hey, this, these are the cool tools I can use um, in QGIS, et cetera. So I see Victoria, you're up to something. What are you doing? Um, I'm trying to build the forest, but I can't get, there's something I'm not able to get right on the, I think on my raster calculator is what I'm trying to mess around with just to see what happens. Hmm. Just... What I was trying to do is get the values in the middle of the range that I picked, but that doesn't seem to be working. All right, while well, you figured that one out, I think let's pop over to Tim and see what he's up to, if he's got his town ready. It's on the side of a well, mountain. <laughs> I'm all over the map, as they say, because <laughs> I've just been... Uh, um, digitizing, I'm using some of the nice uh, digitizing tools to kind of trace along. You can see it sort of, oopsie, that one didn't, um, to trace along the um, coastline and make, I'm just demarcating different land use areas here. Um, so let me just quickly finish that one there. Uh, so I've, I've made another little form um, and um, I'm busy digitizing different land cover classes. 
my town, I've got, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just down a level here. Um, I only digitized six roads so far. I um, tend to have a short attention span. So if digitizing roads gets too, too <laughs> boring, then I jump <laughs> to the next thing. And um, but what I did, what that's interesting in the roads, maybe for those who are interested in the sort of cartography techniques in QGIS, is that um, I use some capping styles. You can see my roads have got round endings, and I use this more advanced thing called symbol levels in QGIS. You can find it if you um, uh, in the styling panel in this uh, option here, symbol levels. Um, and what they do is basically prevent different parts of the symbology overlaying on top of each other. So um, I can show you a simple example if I change it from 2 to 50 or something like that. You can see that road turn black, but basically the stripe in the middle of the road um, is drawn underneath the outer cap, mm. the outer lines of it. So I, I went and just constructed things so that you can see how the roads, they join in um, to each other smoothly and they don't like you don't have things laying on top of each other and also made some rule based symbology so that when you zoom in and out um, the symbology changes to a more simple version of the road so it's not too visually cluttered and for so the coast in, in a real life world that would kind of be your main road and then all the secondary roads would disappear at different um, scales yeah or maybe mm -hmm. change from a thin line to a thick line as i've done here okay. you can see um uh, and then also for the coastline i just used this shape burst fill which is a nice i used the inverted polygon so i copied the same technique that hunts and um i think would also did a mask um, uh, so, well, there's and there's copying going on here <laughs> yeah <laughs> um or i use i should say i used the same technique i don't know if yes <laughs> um and um uh so, so that i created like this little fuzzy coastline effect that's um, really cool i was playing also with the with the dem i actually used a trick to which i think victoria and i or you you and me and victoria i don't know we, we recorded a separate video about it about making um like pre-rendering the hill shade to make it really performant so oh, yes i remember yeah instead of doing the hill shade rendering on the fly i actually um I created the, the shade and then I basically just used the export save as properties, but instead of, this is the default to export the raw data, but I exported the rendered image so that I've actually got a, a layer like, um, which I can probably show you here, which is a TIFF, which is already rendered as, as the dem, uh, uh, sorry, as the hill shade. And that way, and I used the cubic convolution resampling and uh, uh, the, the bicubic, what's it called, um, resampling as well, so that it's, it's all smooth and everything, but it's just rendered as a picture rather than trying to complete that on the fly. Um, normally, I change it to a byte, which is what, what these funny byte things are here. But I don't know, something went wrong. I actually did a command line here to, to, to convert it to a byte. But I think I still missed something. I probably add, need to add some extra compression options because normally if you do this, you can make it a really small file. Um, I think I left out the compression options <laughs> so it's not quite as small. And now I'm busy making land use types, which I'll show you in the next check-in if, <laughs> if we have time for another check-in. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. Well, um, speaking of next check-ins, I think we can hop over to Hans and see how his um hydro stuff is coming along um if his rivers are ready for us to um slide down <laughs> <laughs> well since uh, raymond wasn't yet uh, yet ready with the sewage system i uh, have <laughs> added a, a pollution layer it's just some random pollution just thinking because the houses are also not ready i've seen mm. so people are just uh, nomadic living on that uh, volcano here i assume it's a <laughs> volcano but of course we need to do some field work with uh, the input app or q field um let me see the pollution layer what i did i created um a normal distribution and you can do that with the normal function uh, but it needs an input boolean layer so that means a layer which has only zeros and ones so i filled the whole dem with ones and that's what you can do with the spatial function here 
I give here a value one. I say it's Boolean. So these are the data types that PC Raster is quite strict on. And then uh, a mask, I, I choose the, the DEM, and then it will generate just a, a raster uh, of the same dimensions with the value that I chose here in that data type. And then I use that normal function, but the normal distribution is uh, with zero uh, as an average. So I added uh, 10 to it. Now here I had to cheat a bit and, and well, not cheat. You can do it with these tools, but that's <laughs> for me, it's faster to do that in uh, Python. Let's say yeah. hack a bit. <laughs> yeah. So what this, uh, this does, um, wait. Yeah, it starts here. Pollution is read that normal map from disk and add value 10 and then write it back to disk. That was just my two lines here to uh, to get that uh, pollution layer here. So then it's not uh, between minus one and one with zero as average, but some pollution, nutrients, human excrements between five and 14 units. Mm -hmm. And then we can route those units over the landscape using the Accuflux tool here, which accumulates ma material flowing into a downstream cell without removal. There are here all kinds of other tools when the sewage system is finished that we could use, or mm -hmm. when we have all kinds of measures in place that remove pollution. But uh, since we don't have that, uh, we end up with this. I need to switch off the pollution layer. So in the background, you see our hill shade. And then here in, it's always very difficult to color that, but because the ranges are very large, it's uh, exponential. Mm -hmm. So the trick there is that you uh, use cumulative count. So you can see the, uh, the higher numbers better represented and the lower uh, less. And then choose a ramp that uh, where red is bad, a lot of pollution. So the red lines here is where uh, all the mess goes if we don't have a sewage system. Mm. So let, let's... I think uh, we better get um, <clears throat> Raymond and Leonardo onto the sewage system or else we're going to have a lot of pollution problems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, and I fixed uh, fixed the island in in the meantime. That I um, the above water, and then yeah, this should also already look nice. So oh, okay, also tweak the styling a little bit. Yeah. So everything below uh, the sea level is um, uh, is value zero, and then of mm -hmm. course the hill shade is still visible below that. So the blue part is below zero, but the bathymetry is visible. That's the idea. Okay, cool. So we're seeing a bit of ocean floor there. Yeah, exactly. All right. Brilliant stuff. All right. So we're running a little bit over time. So I think I'll do a last sort of check in with everyone and see where everyone is at. And then we'll finish up. So I know, Ujval, you did say that you finished last time. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything or just a comment. No, I'm, I'm done. I've been enjoying the other learning some tricks from uh, other folks and I'm just creating an animated GIF out of the, the final thing. Uh, QGIS to 3GS doesn't have a built-in animation, but they have a mode where you can rotate uh, the model. So if the, the web view just rotates, I'm just call a screen recorder, capture that, converting to a GIF and I'm just going to upload that as my result. Oh, that would be awesome. Absolutely cool. I can't wait to see that. Alrighty, so next on our list is Tim. Let's see where you're at. Uh, not too much further. I was just busy making a, a labels, and maybe I'll quickly show you a labels layer to put some um, uh, kind of nice Context. labels in the in the sea here. So I was about to just do something like this with the um, whoopsie. Um, let me just digitize the curve here uh, like this, and then we're going to call this. Um, just ocean. I don't know. <laughs> Not very original, <laughs> but anyway, that's. Uh, and then I was just going to set up my label properties. So I'm going to basically label this um, with a, a nice label running along there. Mm. Uh, might have to just use the switch. Um, uh, reverse find direction tool here quickly to just uh, select it. 
this is just a little trick if you if you type in this corner here you get like a quick search for all sorts of functions and data in QGIS and some of them will operate on selected features so I'm just going to reverse the line direction of this um, line and then uh, okay it's, it's done it but you can't really see a difference yet and then I was just going to make my label curve nicely along that line by telling it to go here curved and uh, maybe gonna just pump up that size a bit like oh tim we lost you well at least we lost your screen <laughs> uh, my screen is uh, okay i'll just stop and And if you can see it now and um here we go that's where i met <laughs> that's brilliant i love the curved label you know i was i was messing around with that last month <laughs> for um the waterberg area so I, I like making that sort of thing and just making everything a little bit unique um so this is looking really really cool um, you've got your land uses. Are there any specific land uses? Is there like a, well, a beach your party here, zone? <laughs> settlement areas and some forestry and some rocky outcrops, which yeah, maybe a bit bigger compared to the rest. I should have uh, dug a volcano in the middle like Hans did. I feel you know, <laughs> my, ge my geology is not as exciting as his anymore. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks so much, Tim. I think we're going to hop over quickly to Vicky and see where she's at. Oh, this is looking cool. Um, Vicky, you're on mute. Ah, there you uh, are. So I finally got the forest working. Now I just got um, this, you can see on the side, a paper, sort of paper texture that I I got it from a, uh, one of these QGIS templates. I can't really find it in all my tabs right now, but I want to just sort of throw it over to give it a sort an old old map sort of feel. I'm just test that out for a second. So this is what I the paper texture sort of looks like. Now I just want to lay it softly over the over my features. Hopefully that works in a few minutes. All right, brilliant. Uh, hello, Edson from Tanzania, who's commenting in the comments. <laughs> no, this is lo looking absolutely fantastic. I like the idea of making look sort of old worldy. I think it's really cool to have your own sort of unique mark on a map um, and using an already made um, QGIS style, especially using the QGIS styles repository. Um, if you are a new user, um, Ban Kasim, do definitely have a look at that. Um, it's on the QGIS website. I did share a link at some point. Um, so do have a look at that because that's got a really, a lot of really cool sort of pre-made um, styling that you can use in your own projects. Um, and then I think that's everyone, unless Raymond has some comment for her, uh, for us. Uh, yes, uh, just a little progress. So I'll share oh, my brilliant. Screen. Show us. <laughs> we may no longer need the pollution map. <laughs> uh -huh. Hope so. so it's, just, it's just a little thing. Is that I? Um, I managed to get the plugin up and running. Oh, you brilliant! See? Right there. I can see it. <laughs> but whatever button I press uh, is not really. Uh, doing a lot i tried a few things and here's a, a a pre one thing now suddenly and i don't know why i really cannot reproduce what i saw earlier today but um at least there's some uh, something to to show <laughs> i'm sorry it's just that it's a start no that's great it's very very cool and thanks to um leonardo for helping along and being <laughs> support for the, our sewage system for our little alien world um 
And yeah, I think we're about 15 minutes over. So unless there are any other comments from our amazing team. Mm, uh, just maybe from me to say that if you or those that participated both here in the Jitsi room also um, following along online, if you attach them to that link, which uh, Amy has hopefully put in the description of the of the stream, um, maybe we'll wait till tomorrow and then we'll see what, what's coming by tomorrow and then we'll have some highly democratic process to elect a winner. I'm not sure what that's going to be. <laughs> well, We'll vote on them somehow and uh, send you a nice coffee mug. Are Thanks. those just the GitHub links, Tim? Uh, the one to the GitHub issue one, yeah. That's yeah, in the yeah that's there. at the top of the chat. So yeah. just if you are submitting, scroll up. Also, please put your working pictures or um, I know Ujval is going to have a really cool moving 3D video for us. Um, please do put it on the Telegram channel so that we can all comment and have a look at those. And thanks from me for everybody who joined. I hope you all had fun. I had a good time. It was great fun. <laughs> I learned a lot. Thanks for the idea, Tim. And, you know, thanks for hosting me. I think it was a lot of fun. Uh, all right. Fun. Again, yeah. <laughs> oh, hopefully, we'll have another one of these soon. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, the next QGIS Open Day will be next month. I'll probably start planning in the next couple of weeks. So if you are interested in doing a session or getting involved, please just um, send me a message on Telegram or even Twitter, whichever social media suits you. Um, you'll find me there. I'm usually Ames at some point. <laughs> so please do check us out. All my info or contact information is on the wiki pages. So I just want to say thank you to our amazing team of QGIS wizards. Um, we always learn something new from each other and from you. So thank you so much for taking part in our little freestyle session. And that is the end of this month's QGIS Open Day. Thank you all for joining. Rock on. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone.